thank you, choir, for making uh, that such a, a beautiful start to the day. <clears throat> and Angel, thank you for your sweet testimony. Uh, your parents named you appropriately. Uh, I can't tell you how much I love and appreciate him. I'm going to go a little off script here this morning because I want to share um, an experience I had this morning as I was getting ready to come to school. I had a distinct and powerful impression that my parents would be here in devotional today. My father passed away about a little over 14 years ago and my mother two years before that. And what a tender mercy it was to receive that witness that they would be here today. I want to express gratitude to those who have made uh, changes in their personal schedules to be here today. I'm glad to have my son and daughter and their spouses here today. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today and share some thoughts that have been on my mind for some time. I'd like to speak today on how seemingly small things can lead to big consequences, either for good or bad in our lives. And I want to illustrate this by sharing a few brief stories and a number of examples. There we go. All right. This is a picture of my grandfather, William Reynolds Andrus. His father was instrumental in building the railroads here in the Salt Lake Valley, so it was natural for William to take an interest in railroading. In fact, he studied to be an engineer for the railroad, but was persuaded not to pursue that by his father-in-law. So he chose instead to farm a 20-acre plot in Draper, Utah, and became a very prominent citizen in what was then a small community. I never knew my grandfather in this life. As a young man, he contracted what was then referred to as the flu, but was most likely a strep or other bacterial infection. Left untreated, this led to significant kidney damage and ultimately to his death at the age of 43. At the time of his first illness, penicillin would not be discovered for another 10 years. That microscopic bacteria shortened my grandfather's life by as much as 30 years or more. This is a picture of my family. I'm the dashingly handsome one in the middle. When I was six years old, my family moved all the way from Logan, Utah to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sometime either just before or shortly after that move, I contracted a case of strep throat and it was not treated immediately. Two months later, as I was within weeks of finishing first grade, I got up one morning and I decided I didn't want to go to school. And that was so out of character for me because I loved going to school. I still do. Surprised me, my mother didn't question my decision, and I believe that we were both prompted by the Holy Ghost that I should stay home that day. Within two hours, I was passing significant amounts of blood and had come down with a severe kidney infection. Fortunately for me, by taking this little mold, penicillin, which was now widely available, and by making constant visits to the doctor and three months recuperation in bed, literally my entire summer, I was cured from this horrible infection. That little mold saved my life and has allowed me to live a much longer, healthier life than did my grandfather. Same disease, big difference. Later that same year, my family built a new house, and we moved in just before Thanksgiving, so appropriate to tell a Thanksgiving story here. Okay. It was 
Um, not a great Thanksgiving, though. We woke up Thanksgiving morning uh, with headaches, uh, nausea, vomiting. It was not you know, the kind of Thanksgiving you'd want to have. It was discovered later that a small gas leak in the water heater was the culprit causing the most miserable Thanksgiving that I can remember. Thankfully, the water heater was located in the garage just next to the kitchen rather than inside the house where things could have been much worse. In more recent years, my family has suffered carbon monoxide poisoning more than, more than once, leading me to question at times why we were spared when others have not been. But I know without a doubt that the Lord has watched over us. Again, small things that can lead to great consequences. Next story. This is about a pint of cream, uh, which is referred to as strippings in the story that I'm going to share with you next. From the Journal of Discourses, we read the following as written by Elder George A. Smith. And the language is a little quaint, so, so bear with me. Quote, the wife of Thomas B. Marsh, who was then president of the Twelve Apostles, and Sister Harris concluded that they would exchange milk in order to make a little larger cheese than they otherwise could. To be sure to have justice done, it was agreed that they should not save the strippings, but that the milk and strippings should all go together. Small matters to talk about here, but to be sure, two women's exchanging milk to make cheese. Mrs. Harris, it appeared, was faithful to the agreement and carried to Mrs. Marsh the milk and strippings. But Mrs. Marsh, wishing to make some extra good cheese, saved a pint of strippings from each cow. And sent Mrs. Harris the milk without the strippings. Finally, it leaked out that Mrs. Marsh had saved strippings and it became a matter to be settled by the teachers. They began to examine the matter and it was proved that Mrs. Marsh had saved the strippings and consequently, she had wronged Mrs. Harris out of that amount. An appeal was taken from the teacher to the bishop and a regular church trial was had. President Marsh did not consider that the bishop had done him and his lady justice for they decided that the strippings were wrongfully saved and that the woman had violated her covenant. Marsh immediately took an appeal to the High Council, who investigated the question with much patience, and I assure you they were a grave body. Marsh, being extremely anxious to maintain his, the character of his wife, as he was the president of the Twelve Apostles and a great man in Israel, made a desperate defense but the High Council finally confirmed the bishop's decision. Marsh, not being satisfied, took an appeal to the First Presidency of the Church, and Joseph and his counselors had to sit upon the case, and they approved the decision of the High Council. This little affair, you will observe, kicked up a considerable breeze, and Thomas B. Marsh then declared that he would sustain the character of his wife, even if he had to go to hell for it. The then president of the Twelve Apostles, the man who should have been the first to do justice and cause reparation to be made for wrong committed by any member of his family, took that position. And what next? He went before a magistrate and swore that the Mormons were hostile towards the state of Missouri. That affidavit brought from the government of Missouri an exterminating order which drove some 15,000 saints from their homes and habitations, and some thousands perished through suffering the exposure consequent of this state of affairs." Close quote. So after 18 years of apostasy, Thomas B. Marsh requested rebaptism and was admitted back into the church. Consider for a moment what might have been had President Marsh remained faithful to his calling. He was the first president of the Quorum of the Twelve. As we understand it today, that placed him directly behind Joseph Smith in seniority. So perhaps today, BYU might be known as TMU. 
Okay. Or could it possibly be Marshville up north instead of Brigham City? What else might have been different? Ponder that. I love it when President Uchtdorf talks about airplanes and flying. So we're going to talk about airplanes and flying for just a minute here. Did you know that airplanes are off course 90% of the time? Good instrumentation and constant attention from the pilot can correct this. But consider this, being off course by only one degree, that's less than three-tenths of one percent, takes us 92 feet off course for every mile traveled. On a cross-country flight from New York to Los Angeles, we'll be 40 miles off course and likely somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. The instrumentation can be likened to the Holy Ghost, who gives us warnings when we're off course in our lives. Like the pilot, we must heed the warnings and take corrective action to remain on course. President Gordon B. Hinckley, speaking of the time that he worked for a railroad, told the story of a train going from Oakland, California to Newark, New Jersey, with 300 passengers on board. The baggage did not arrive with the passengers. The baggage car was to be switched in St. Louis to another railroad. According to President Hinckley, quote, some thoughtless switchmen in the St. Louis yards moved a small piece of steel just three inches, a switch point, then pulled the lever to uncouple the car. We discovered that a baggage car that belonged in Newark, New Jersey was in fact in New Orleans, Louisiana, 1,500 miles from its true destination. That is the way it is with our lives. Instead of following a steady course, we are pulled by some mistaken idea in another direction. The movement away from our original destination may be ever so small, but if continued, that very small movement becomes a great gap and we find ourselves far from where we intended to go." Close quote. In athletic events, small things can significantly impact the outcome of those events. A block pass or a fumble that causes a turnover can literally shift the momentum of the game. Sorry, BYU fans. A dropped fly ball can make the difference between winning and losing a baseball game. In the Olympics, events are won by fractions of an inch or in milliseconds of time. Over the many years that I've worked with students in competitive events, I've observed that it's usually the little things that separate the winners from everyone else. I'm amazed at how often events are won with just one or two points difference between first and second place. This picture depicts Lehi's dream. The rod of iron depicts the word of God or the gospel. As long as people hold fast to it, they continue on the path to eternal life or the tree. There are many things that can cause us to let go of the rod and wander off into the unknown. It may be the clouds of darkness that blind us or the words of scorn from that great and spacious building, the world. Simple things may creep into our lives, such as not praying, criticizing church leaders, not paying our tithing or going to church, or not shaving today, or any other dress, grooming, or honor code violation. With the excuse that just this once won't hurt anything. Clayton Christensen, in his book, How Will You Measure Your Life, says, quote, many of us have convinced ourselves that we are able to break our own personal rules just this once. In our minds, we can justify these small choices. None of those things, when they first happen, feels like a life-changing decision. But each of those decisions can roll up into a much bigger picture, turning you into the kind of person you never wanted to be." Close quote. We all have little things in our lives that, if left unattended, can have a devastating impact on our eternal progression. Fortunately for each of us, the atonement of our Savior provides a way for us to rid ourselves 
of those small things and continue to grasp or return to the iron rod. The Holy Ghost, when heated, can help us to make those small one degree changes that will help us keep on course towards eternal life and exaltation. Next example. This is my granddaughter, Ellie. I can see a smile down there, good. Um, her smile can literally light up a room. She was baptized last month. She's learned at a very early age how to use the phone to entice her grandmother to partic participate in personal play dates just for her. She regularly draws pictures of hearts with little messages expressing her love for others. I could fill the whole slide deck with pictures that she's done. Uh, the week before her baptism, she called me and asked, Grandpa, will you be a witness for my baptism? I learned later that she'd called others as well to participate on her baptismal program. Small gestures, huge impact. 20 years ago, I received a special letter from my son Ryan, Ellie's father, while he was serving on his mission. I carried Ryan's letter with me everywhere for many years. I won't share what's in the letter because it is very personal, but in the letter he expressed his gratitude for the influence I had had on him. And however small that influence might have been, I've seen it magnified and multiplied many times over in his own influence in his children's lives. You may not think you're having any impact on others, but think again. Love you, Ryan. My favorite all-time movie is It's a Wonderful Life. And I see a smile from my daughter here. Even though it's a little old and corny, my daughter and I have uh, made watching it a Christmas tradition for many years. I've been known to include uh, the question, what is my favorite all-time movie and why, in, uh, uh, as a bonus question on quizzes at times. Uh, and the important part of that question is why. This movie illustrates just how much impact one person can have for good in the lives of others. Each one of you is far more important in the lives of others than you realize. Little things. A smile, a kind word, a thoughtful gesture, or an expression of gratitude. Each can have a remarkable positive influence in the lives of others. I wasn't blessed with a natural smile on my face. Uh, it takes extra effort for me to even appear to smile. In fact, my parents used to wonder what I was up to if I was grinning. But, and my children often accused me of giving them the look. Okay, and it's, it's something to do with this little crease on my forehead. But anyway, um, I relate a lot to Mormon. Uh, at the age of 10, he was told by Amaron, I perceive thou art a sober child. So please know that I'm smiling inside, even when it may not appear that way. I'm really just a big teddy bear with a crooked smile that doesn't always turn up on the corners. It's an incredible opportunity and a blessing for me to work with you students, many of whom have significant challenges in your lives. A number of years ago, I received a letter from a student that had a huge impact on my life. In her letter, she described a conversation we had had and thanked me for seeing in her the potential that she did not see in herself. If I can give any of you a small ray of hope or the assurance that Heavenly Father loves you and hears and answers your prayers, then I know I have accomplished something worthwhile. One last example. This is a depiction of Joseph Smith's first vision. Think for just a moment of the impact of that single prayer on your own life. Look around at those who surround you here today. Our very being here today is a result of that one prayer. Your very being here today is also an accumulation of the many small decisions that you have made, the prayers that you've offered, the prayers of others offered in your behalf, and listening to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. It is not 
by coincidence, but by divine design. Your prayers may seem a small thing to you, but be assured that they are not to Heavenly Father. Even though we may never experience glorious or miraculous uh, visions from our prayers, it is my testimony to you that God hears and answers even our most simple, humble prayers. I have witnessed this countless times in my own life regarding even the most basic things. The Holy Ghost is a most precious gift given to us because Heavenly Father wants us to return to Him. So remember, just as a microscopic bacteria can weaken us to the point it takes our life, or a small unrepented act can lead us to apostasy, so can a simple prayer and listening to the promptings of the Holy Ghost lead us back. May we listen and heed those ever so quiet promptings that will lead us to correct our course and hold fast to that iron rod that we may reach the tree of life. As we've sung in the opening hymn today, may we do what is right and let the consequence follow. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.